I get angry real easy most of the time, so it's kind of hard to explain. One thing that sets my triggers off because I don't like to be threatened. I don't care who you are. It's just the way I grew up. I've been locked up for five years in the Department of Corrections. Before that, I was in another placement. So. Kids who have any sort of emotional control issue or discontrol issue, such as anger, who don't learn to control that, manage, I don't want to say control, I want to say manage, who don't learn to manage that, are by definition going to become more and more angry as they are successful at being angry and don't have any other successful skills. Shanti. You guys gotta call him out. Let, let me talk. Come here. Shanti, here's, Atlanta's gonna talk to you. Shanti. Come here, talk to Atlanta. I'm real familiar with him. And when he's angry, he, he tends to Let me take you the situation right here. Calm down. And then, don't do anything to yourself, okay? So sit down, calm down. Okay. Listen, listen to me. Calm down. Don't pop that door, Dobbs. I'll be right back, okay? Let me get him on his way. I'll come back and talk to you, okay? Will you not do anything until then, please? It'll just be a matter of minutes, okay? Please. Shanti. Take some breaths. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Shanti. Okay. Shanti, get up. He's talking to you. Shanti. Come here. Hey. Shanti. I'm down. I know. I know how he is. He just. He's just trying to he keep from hurting himself. Doing that, and he's coming down though. We're just trying to get him calm down. That's the main thing now. Step back. Step back. Step back. Have a seat. Have a seat. What's up, man? I saw someone in the break. Take a deep breath. What's going on? He wanted to take me, so I wanted to see if he can carry it out. Come ask for toe off. Because I was talking to the nurse. She said, get back to my mom. Are you going to throw me in there? I want to see if he can carry it out. Couldn't because I was throwing the around. Clarence, stand by. He was throwing around. Clarence, stand by. 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 Clarence, and actually, when I went in the unit, I seen him sitting there, and I kind of did this, just kind of joking. So he came out, and he was asked to go back in, and he didn't like the way he was asked, and he, he exacerbates really easily. The whole thing started because I came out here to talk to the nurse, and he's going to throw me and tell me to get my unit, or he's going to throw me in my unit, and I don't like to get threatened, so I told him I like to see him prove it. So. I was in my office counseling a couple other kids. And I looked out my window, and one of the kids that was sitting at a table here, I saw his head look out the door. I knew he was looking at something that wasn't normal. And so I, I yelled at him, uh, Heath, uh, what, what's going on? And he went like that. And I knew he was telling me something. So I came to the door, saw the officer and Mr. Shanti struggling. First, I wasn't sure if they some sort of horseplay or something, but I, it wasn't. It was real, and so I called the signal 10. I could see it escalating beyond. Hey, here. Take deep breath. Take deep breath. Take deep breath. Count to five. Take a deep breath. You relax? Yes. Okay. Listen. What? Explain to me what's going on. No, I just don't like staff threatening me. Okay. If okay. they don't want to carry it out, I don't like to be trained. I can take care of that. I can take care of that. I understand. I, I, I heard the story. I'll handle that. What are you in your duties, sir? None. 
Yeah. Yeah. That was last night. That was last night. I hit myself one time. What's the purpose? Self-mutilators, for the most part, appear to be motivated by relieving some sort of distress, psychological distress or situational distress. They've developed this as a coping skill, which is maladaptive and yet temporarily very effective to get them out of whatever situation they're trying to escape. So it sort of reinforces itself. There is probably some addictive component to it. And it is hard for us to know, and I'm not speaking just about the psychology staff now, but also the correctional staff. We have to take it seriously. We have to attempt to get the behavior to extinguish. To do that, you have to pay attention to it, and yet we don't want to pay so much attention that the attention itself also becomes reinforcing. So it's a very difficult balancing act. This is what I need you to do. You sit here for a minute, relax, Catch your breath. Do whatever you do to calm yourself down rather than hurt yourself. I'm going to have Sarge over here go get your jacket out the room. In about five to ten minutes, I need you to go down to medical and get checked out. Actually, Alana's here to talk to him now. Oh, is okay. she? Okay. Alana, she wants to check him out. Okay. Hey. Give me five minutes. Okay. Go ahead, finish one of medical movement. But will you contact with me right now that you won't do anything else? Mm -hmm. Promise? But a little one on one and you know, just talking with him a little bit a lot of times works. Okay, and then once you leave time out, you heard once he's calm. In about 10 minutes, I want to send him down there. Then let him calm down, and I'll give him some one on one and check him over real good. Okay. Okay, are you hurt anywhere now? Okay. No. I'm sorry. I. Okay, nothing else. I'll see you in a little bit. Okay? I'm going to step out. Don't move until we walk out. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Shanti and I, we, I, I've been his counselor for two years. I've been with him for four. As a, I was an officer with him for two, counselor for two. You're gonna do what? I'm talking to the nurse and he said he's gonna throw me in the unit. Bro, I wanted to see if he could carry it out. He's crazy, he couldn't. You know that's not the way to get home, man. I don't like to be great. You see where you are. You're not great because I'm going to be here. That's not the way to get out. You know that. He can be the guy. If he's the guy, I'm sorry. He's going to carry it out. I don't care. Okay. 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 I know when he's just playing or getting serious, and he was definitely serious. Somebody could have really got hurt. He's strong. He's strong. I think overwhelmingly, people who fall back on this sort of mechanism to relieve their psychological distress are very uncomfortable with emotion for a number of reasons. And a lot of that is that they've had a lifetime of having their feelings invalidated and they either come to believe that it is wrong to have feelings at all, and therefore when you have one you have to do something to get rid of it, or that their own particular feelings are somehow bad, and that therefore they're a bad person. No, because I was talking to the nurse, because the nurse the nurse said hello. And I went out there and talked to him. He, said, he told me to get back in the unit or he's going to phone me. And I wanted to see if he could do it. Okay. So I, th so so, I was like, really? Okay, okay. Put my okay. pencil back in there. Okay, this, this, okay, this is, okay. In that little part of that story, somewhere in there, there's a reason why he would come out the control pod and make you go back in the unit. Did he ask you to go back in the unit? No. Stand by for it. He told okay. me. 
He, t- he did what? He told, me, he told me to go in there. He was going to throw me in there. Okay, but why would he tell you he's going to throw you in there? Because I wasn't going to come, supposed to come out in the first place. But I just came out to talk to the nurse without his permission. That's the problem. Here we go. But now we get to the room. Right to but listen, listen, Shanti. This is what you need to understand. You aren't supposed to be out there, right? No. That's the problem. You have to understand that. If you weren't supposed to be out there, then he's going to tell you he needs you to go back in there. You have to follow instructions. You don't follow instructions, then we run into this problem, continuously run into this problem with you. You have to follow instructions. You don't follow instructions. When you get released, you're going to come right back in here. Matter of fact, you're 18. 19. Eight, 19, you'll be across the street in the adults. I ain't coming back. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but if you don't start following instructions, you will. So I just want to make sure he gets checked out. And can I get a toilet? Hello, man. It's okay. Uh-huh. Come on, Santi. This facility has a 24/7 full-time uh, medical unit. Um, that you know, we there is always uh, medical staff on on duty over there. But it is it it is uh, it, it is the pulse of the facility in in many respects, and there are constantly um, offenders in and out of the medical department for just a, a wide variety of, of of issues. And some of them are self-inflicted issues, you know, and juvenile issues, you know, kids doing dumb things, causing injuries to themselves. Um, so it, it's something that the the medical staff here, I think they have, they they really rise to the occasion and, and, and take to heart, you know, the population that they're working with, and they they truly uh, they truly take their time and they work hard with the offenders to to try to to make a difference and educate them when they when they do things that weren't exactly the smartest thing to do they, they truly they do take time to really educate them in, in hopes that they they will, won't do that again and a lot of times it sounds weird but i treat these kids like i do my own kids you, you know they're, they're kids you know they do have a playful side to them and most of these kids you get to know their issues and you know what they respond to i've always loved it i mean yeah, you see things you're not going to see other places, but um, a lot of the kids are like him. You know, if you know how to deal with them, and you, a lot of times if you treat them with respect, you'll get it back. Not always, but it's just learning them. You know. You got physical force. Uh, you got form. Did you do it already? No, I haven't. Did you and learn I... from this experience? Hmm? Did you learn something from this experience? Follow instruction. Mm-hmm. Follow instruction. They, they, they always keep you out of trouble. And you said Officer Dobbs? I'm yes, like ma'am. Hmm? I'm I understand. I'm like to be fine. So that's where you hit yourself, right there? Yeah. Let me see. Do you want me to go into detail on that PRT? Try yeah, PRT. That's what they put. It's PRT. Try the PRT. Huh? Try the PRT. Leave it alone. You don't want no ice or anything for it? I just put that you were taken to timeout. You walked over here, you need to take your vitals. You didn't choke yourself out? Nope. I'm not choking, I'm cutting. I know that, I'm just asking. These behaviors, as I said, fall into a category that has a hundred different names and they include things as diverse as purposely bruising oneself, burning, and that can be either with a cigarette or a match or some other source of heat, or also skin burns by rubbing. We see a lot of eraser burns. Um, It can be head banging. It can be, some people consider overeating to be a a form of this. Um, But by and large, what we see is cutting. Uh, in, in kids, in adults, in anyone who is engaging in this sort of behavior, the research is pretty clear that well over half of those behaviors involve cutting. Did 
The only other thing I have to do is take his Bible signs. Okay, quick. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Come I just on. need a copy of that whenever you're done. So I can put it with the rest of the paperwork. Excuse me. Back. Get out of there. I was just showing you where it was. You know, I was just in here earlier so I could see the doctor. I brought my asthma. You want? Yeah. Forget the chance. You're all right. Yep. Yeah. Lady, I think I know how to do it. Let's get yeah. your blood pressure. I'm more concerned about your blood pressure than your pulse. That's not me. It probably wouldn't have been that a little bit ago, <laughs> but it is now. template he's gonna send down a copy so you can know where all the boxes and stuff are okay do you have any blank ones yes i do okay oh uh, i do know i see about dr craig seeing him in a little while i've already been seen okay. by dr jake today oh yeah all right this morning yeah do you still need him no i'm done you're done all right well then i'll just let him know grab jacket talking call me if you need me okay, okay. Jake. 35 got one day three with a medical phone back to a yes ma'am Most self-mutilators tell us, I did it to feel better, or I did it to stop feeling. Most self-mutilators do not have a really good capability of tolerating negative emotion. And when they cut, they focus on that instead of the negative emotion, which makes the negative emotion essentially go away. And then some of them are so impulsive that they say, I don't know, I just cut. Jacob was great on He's a good kid. I got bored. So you're trying to lose fingers because you got bored? Nope. They locked us in the room. Again? Yeah, because of a Steinberg and a You know what? Every time. Remember, we're fighting. Every time Steph does something and you don't agree with it, this is what you do, isn't it? You nope. cut or you tie or something, don't you, Bob? Every time. Because you just want everything to be fair, right? We would look at that as the precipitating trigger of the behavior, and therefore we would be looking at all of the things that, that make him vulnerable to feeling that way and the feelings that are attached to it that he either feels responsible or he in, and approach it from that way therapeutically. So, so the work there is to, is to analyze that at a level that you can find out what made it his issue. I'm not really all that familiar with his personal background, you know, as far as when he was a little kid and his family life. I, I really don't know that much. I don't know a lot about a lot of these kids. Sometimes I don't want to know. Um, but every time I've dealt with Jacob, he's been respectful to me. Um, he's not profane. He's not vulgar. He just, he, to me, he's just a nice kid. He, I'm sure he has a lot of past issues. At the age of three, my dad tried to kill me, so yeah. 
I'm gonna dad out try to kill me. I'll leave me now in the blizzard. He what? They left me on the blizzard when I was three. I was taken with my dad and I was putting my mom, because my dad went to prison for 10 years for uh, child abuse and attempted murder. So, and my mom went to, my mom went to jail for stabbing her, uh, her husband after my dad 47 times in the back. So I was put in a place called Meadows and I was there for like nine years. And after Meadows, I went to a place called Res Care. And after that, I was put in a uh, foster home. I was in a foster home for like two years until I got arrested. So came here. I've been here for like four or five years. There are, there are a number of concurrent factors uh, kind of across the board. The most common things that are associated with cutting are psychological distress, person, some personality characteristics, sometimes situational distress, drug and alcohol use, um, overall sort of characterological impulsivity, the person who is more impulsive and lacks coping skills might, might lean toward this. Um, there is no research that I am familiar with to indicate that everyone who cuts or anything like everyone who cuts has a common history. He's pretty much his own worst enemy. He's not a batterer. I've never known him to hit another kid or staff or anything, but like I said, he's his own worst enemy. He, he has a pretty much a permanent spot on his forehead where he has repeatedly just crashed his forehead into the wall or whatever he can crash it into. So now it's easily opened. He has that. He's probably going to have that the rest of his life. And of course his arms. He just has marks all over his arms from pencil lead or paper clips or staples or whatever he could do. He feels no pain. Look at his arm. He, he's a self-mutilator. He cuts on himself. Uh, for self-stimulation. Yeah, he, he has a lot of anger issues, and especially, it seems to be directed a lot of times at women. He doesn't like them telling him what to do. And he takes offense to that, or anyone challenging his masculinity or toughness. He wants to prove them wrong. Research generally shows that anywhere from 1 to 4 percent of the United States population has engaged in some sort of behavior like this. That's generally kids, adults across the entire population. A number of studies have shown that ad adolescents engage in this at a rate much higher. About 10 percent of kids in the ninth grade say that they have at least experimented with some sort of self-harm behavior. And about 4% four, 4 of kids in the ninth grade and younger are repetitive self-harmers. Of those folks, about the prevalence rate is about three to seven times higher for females than for males. When I was a kid, they had me on so many pills. Wow. And it killed all my nerve cells in this arm. So you really can't feel anything? No, just like I can't no nothing in my face. It, I find with him, he does really well until he feels he's been treated unfairly. Like the rules have been broken, you know, an established rule and it's always staff against him. He plays along really well until that happens. And when that happens, he, he just, I guess he takes control over his situation by cutting. I don't know. There is some research emerging that there's probably a qualitative difference between the repetitive self-harm behaviors and the occasional or one-time behaviors and that probably those are very different phenomena that ought to be approached differently. That, that research is just now emerging. Um, the, obviously we have to take, we have to intervene more immediately and more strenuously with someone who is engaging in a behavior that is potentially har at placing them at risk for accidentally suiciding. Um, there is also, and I, think I alluded to this earlier, there is also a concern that these behaviors may have some addictive component. If it feels good the first time when I do it a little bit, I'll try it the next time. That wasn't so bad, now I'll do it a little bit more and that perhaps some of the lesser forms then grow into a more serious form. What if my uncle goes in my mind? Why do we gotta be trapped in our rooms for other people? Because 
that's group punishment. This this place ain't supposed to be a corporal punishment facility. It's supposed to be individual, and they don't follow that rule. So that made me mad. Not much goes through my mind. It just, it just takes off a lot of stress up off me because I'm diagnosed with SDPD. What's that? Social uh, social stress disorder. So I'm diagnosed with ADHD, bipolar, and some other stuff. So. Are you on medication? No, the meds they put me on here, I was allergic to. So, so you're on no meds? No. And they do, I do better without the meds anyways. We have identified the cutting as a, as a target behavior that we want to extinguish. And what we're looking for is for that kid or adult to develop insight into all of the precipitating actions, events, emotions that led up to it that made them actually pick up the razor, the glass, the whatever, and start cutting. And so we do what's called a uh, chain analysis on that. And so instead of actually focusing on the cutting itself, we focus, we lead them through a variety of steps to help them understand this, this is what pushed me over the edge and made me actually do it. These were the vulnerabilities I had at the time. These were the triggers that got me there so that over the course of time they develop insight and are able to utilize other coping skills because again, maladaptive as it is, cutting is a coping skill to handle a distressing situation. I, I think a lot of times, um, what I'm guessing and what I've understood from people who, who self-mutilate, self-cut, is that they do it because it's an expression. They have, they have so many things in their lives that they have no control over that they can control the pain and the damage they do to themselves. And for some reason they say it makes them feel good. I'm not really sure. Maybe it's the power thing? I'm not sure. But I, I'm, I, I believe it has a lot to do with the um, control. Sorry, Bobby. Where'd you get this? Is this from your mattress? No. Is it from your mattress? What's it from, then? Hmm? You can tell me. I'm not going to say anything. What's it from? Pillow. Pillow. So I thought we were trying to go home. I got my level drop for knocking off Smith. So what level are you on now? Two. So now you just give up? Nah, he's not going to give up. OK, let's go wash you off and get some circulation going. For the most part, the, the research is very clear on this point that what we call, and there are, there are hundreds of names for this, deliberate self-harm, parasuicidal behavior, non-suicidal self-harm, um, self-mutilation, the list goes on and on and on. The definition that, that professionals widely agree on is that this is behavior that causes bodily injury and is not intended to result in suicide. He's done it before, and it is shocking. I mean, his nail beds were purple. You know, that's pretty bad, but like I said, he's done it before. And I knew that once we got the strings off, the circulation would return right away, and it did. So I just washed him up, and he just kind of needed to talk to somebody a little bit. Feels like some fire. I bet it does feel like, you know why it feels like that? Hmm? Can you hear me, Jacob? Huh? Why do you think it feels like that? Circulation foam back? Yep. Those nerve endings, huh? How many times I've been told that? I know. Like At least 12 by me, huh? Now, you're going to act silly when you get back, or you're going to be okay? It means you're going to lock me down. Wow. Do you need me to call somebody? Are you going to behave it? Not hurt yourself? It means you're going to lock me down. Because they got us on line. I'm trying to make you a deal. I'm trying to make you a personal deal. And I'm telling you an answer. Okay, if I can get it so that you're not locked down, will you sign a contract to save you for me? Yeah. Okay. Is that a deal? Move them around a little bit. Try to get them going. Make them get nails. You don't want it hot, just warm. Okay? Hot. No. Hot will damage that skin that's already having a hard time. You gotta keep moving them for a while. Because once that string comes off, I can easily move them. I know, but keep moving them anyway, okay? 
know you're not having trouble, but we gotta get that blood flow going. Is that where I nipped you right there? I think you nipped me. I did. You cut so, so close there. Most self-mutilators tell us, I did it to feel better, or I did it to stop feeling. Most self-mutilators do not have a really good capability of tolerating negative emotion. And when they cut, they focus on that instead of the negative emotion, which makes the negative emotion essentially go away. So you'll come out there and sign a contract if I talk to your officer, right? Put those down. All of them. Come on. I already cut the box. <laughs> come on, Jacob, come on, put them down. I've <laughs> known Jacob for a couple years, and I know he's not a batterer. And most of these kids, you get to know their issues and you know what they respond to. And that's why I just was kind of playing around with them and said, just give me those gloves back. And I went and reached for them because I knew he was not going to do anything whatsoever. Now, if it was another kid that is a batterer, I wouldn't have been nearly, you know, as familiar with him as I was with Jacob. But he's, he's, a, he's a good kid. I've never had any problems. I've never heard him cuss or curse or be disrespectful to any staff. So he's just, he's one of those kids that kind of gets a place in your heart maybe. You know, there are a few here that really do and he's one of them. Come out there and sign a contract for me, okay? And I'll talk to your officer. I think certainly one thing that we do know from the research is that cutting itself has been on a dramatic increase in the last decade to decade and a half and is probably not likely to go away anytime soon. Um, I think certainly the sooner we intervene with kids, the better. On the other hand, intervening with kids in a clinical setting without addressing the larger societal issues that got them into the clinical setting is probably not going to be much of a fix. You know the drill with this, right? Saying so you're not going to harm yourself. Officer Arnold, and if so, you're going to let us know, right? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alright, so you're going to let us know if you harm yourself again, right? Or if you're thinking about it? I feel every day as a medical staff that I am making a difference every day because maybe this is the first time these offenders have ever received health care for their first time in their life. A lot of people in their position, a lot of people in their position have never received health care because their families don't have health insurance. So I think that as far as the medical staff here, we have a huge um, role in being role models for them. You have to have a thick skin, you really do. And manipulation, you know, these kids are master manipulators and it makes it very difficult because, you know, being a mom, like I said before, it's real easy to get tied into wanting to believe everything they say, you know, and sympathizing and empathizing with them, but you just can't. You know, you know, my boss, my old boss used to say, they didn't get here for being smart and they didn't get here for being good. So I think you have to understand that point too. But, you know, the caring comes out like, like with the nursing profession, you know, that's part of it, being a caring person. And also the mom instinct too. And most of us here are parents. You know, so we, we have that feeling, that tendency anyway, to be a little bit more compassionate. As a nurse, it is. You know, that's what you're taught, is to be caring. And you are, but you have to know where that line is. And that, that's what it takes a while to learn. Everyone who comes to work in the Department of Corrections does an initial piece of training with the Department of Corrections for about a week before they actually hit the, their office. And so the correctional staff do some of that work. Um, 
but then on the other hand, those correctional staff, for the most part, are not accustomed to having someone sit in their office for a half hour to an hour alone. Um, and we're not wearing uniforms and we don't look like officers because we aren't. And so there is a, a different sort of attitude. I personally have never felt as threatened within a correctional environment as I have in other environments. And I think that is because in a correctional setting, there are some wonderful people out there called correctional officers who have my back. And they're looking for things to happen. We're in a community setting. Everyone assumes nothing bad will happen. And in fact, it does sometimes. I find that I use my sense of humor a lot. You know, I could say pretty much what I want to say and say it <laughs> in a way that either they respond to or they don't, but most of the time they do, because humor helps a lot. You know, you can get away with a lot using humor. You know, you just do the best you can to get to know the kid and know how to deal the, be the best you can with that particular kid, because what works for him is not going to work for another one. And, and that's really the best thing you can do is being consistent, being firm, and not being too motherly, but yet being respectful and showing that you do value what they have to say, but you have to set limits. Because if you don't, then they're, they're trying to figure out a way to get around you to get what they want. Life inside as a psychologist or a counselor or a therapist isn't like the TV shows and it isn't like the movies and it is very necessary that they acknowledge their discomfort in, in the beginning because if they don't have it, I'm worried about them and that they talk about that with a lot of people and they accept that they are going to in fact be uncomfortable and therefore probably not as effective in their role as they're experienced at being because there is a learning curve and an emotional curve to have to go through to walk into this environment and do business. Go there and have a seat. It'll be just a minute. Until I'm injured. He signed a contract with me that he would behave and he would stay out of trouble and not self-mutilate if you would let him sit in the chairs. Yes, I had him sign a contract for safety. And he'll stick to it. He won't hurt himself because he signed it. He's just, that's just him. That's just his way. Post up with me. Yeah, he signed a contract. Yeah, he signed a contract saying that he would follow the contract if you would let him sit in the blue chairs. Okay? I just want to make sure I didn't want to send him back without talking to you. All right, thank you. Fine. He said that was fine. Okay? So he can go back. My hope for Jacob is that he would be able to, to handle his anger without harming himself. So someday he could go out and have a life because there's another side of him that's that's smart and and you know funny and creative and if he could just use that side more then he just needs to learn how to handle you know his anger and stop turning it inward Okay. Don't do any damage to yourself. Clear, prepare um, them right? to stand by. <laughs> Even if it doesn't hurt. Yeah. What, what I really want to do is when I turn 21, I want to come here and be an officer. So I can show I can show kids the way I grew up and they don't want to grow up like that. So I spent most of my life here, yes. I spent most of my life here in different facilities, so yes, I think I could really connect with kids. Because no kid should have a life I grew up with. Nobody because it's just wrong. Increasingly in the outside world, the outside world being the one outside the concertina wire for me, other forces are really driving what happens therapeutically. And a correctional environment is probably the last bastion of really being able to help an underserved population that otherwise would not have access to the help. And for many of us, that's why we enter the field.